Jan Vermon, over there, studied at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Maastricht in Comparative Law and the Protection of the Lawyer-Client Privilege. He published a book on political defense within court cases and is co-founder of the Progress Lawyers Network and Deputy Secretary General of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. Fermont is specialized in Belgian, European and international panel law. As a political lawyer, he has defended labor union representative Roberto Dorazio, Turkish terrorism suspect Fegria Erdal, and Dutrou victim Letizia Delez. He has defended the interests of 19 Iraqi victims of US war crimes committing during the invasion of Baghdad against US General Tommy Franks. Fermont has provided legal assistance to José Maria Sison and uh, has been leading an international team of lawyers in a successful plea to remove Sison from the EU list of designated terrorists. Of all speakers, you have the most extensive knowledge of the particular juridical aspects of the case of Professor Sison, and specifically his inclusion on the EU list of designated terrorists. Could you perhaps tell us, based on your expertise, expertise what is at stake in such a procedure and how it intervenes in international efforts of peace negotiation? Ladies and gentlemen, I will try to make, uh, to give you some additional information on the case of Jose Maria Sison uh, and the proceedings that were waged in that case. And while doing so, I'll try to make some comments, first of all, on what the listing process uh, shows us about democracy in Europe, and secondly, if some time is left, uh, on the incompatibility of the anti-terrorist legislation or the anti-terrorist legal framework with the system of international law as it was built after the Second World War, and in which the right to fight for liberation gained some legal status at some point. And I would say even worse, how the anti-terrorist legislation, or the use of this anti-terrorist framework, encouraged, in the particular case of the Philippines, militarization, state terrorism, and became an obstacle to uh, the peace negotiations. First, on democracy in Europe. Uh, I think it's interesting to see how Jaume Sison uh, knew about uh, his inclusion in the list. He was not, uh, the inclusion in the, in, in the list was not the uh, result of a process in which uh, evidence or in which uh, facts were discussed. Jaume Sison in fact heard about his inclusion in the list because he had this card with which he paid his groceries at Albert Heijn. And then, uh, at some point, suddenly Albert Heijn started to complain that the groceries were not paid anymore. Normally, at the end of the month, the bank paid these groceries. And that's actually how John Sison, when he went to the bank and he said, why don't you pay my bills, as you have been doing for the last years, that's actually how John Sison found out that he was included in a terrorist list, in a Dutch terrorist list, and that all his assets were frozen. So, no kind of trial, no debate, no evidence presented, a completely secret, obscure process uh, of which he heard, in, in fact, by chance. We found out later in which conditions this first inclusion in a list was done. Uh, he already referred to the, to the visit of uh, Colin Powell in August 2002 uh, to the Philippines. As a result of that uh, visit in the beginning of August 2002, John Massison was included in the U.S. list of uh, designated terrorists on the 12th of August 2002. And on the 13th of August, the Dutch authorities took a specific Dutch regulation against him, a sanctuary regulation, um, freezing all his assets and uh, uh, submitting him to uh, very harsh sanctions. When we later, and I make parentheses here on the role of the United States, when we said later that it was obvious that this was U.S. inspired, the Dutch authorities in the proceedings before the European uh, Court of Justice, the Dutch authorities said, no, 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 this has nothing to do with the U.S. This is nothing, this is our own decision. We, we found that there was sufficient uh, materials to include this man in a Dutch uh, terrorist listing. Well, that was a little bit contradictory with what we found later on the uh, website of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, they have this country uh, profiles in which they describe 
the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs describes the relationships with uh, the various countries in the world, and the, 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 the profile of the Philippines, first of all, uh, said that uh, the, the relations were excellent, that more than 150 Dutch uh, companies were active in the Philippines, uh, that there was no problem, that everything was going well. And then it, it, it continued, and I will translate from French again to, to English, so please, uh, it, it might not be the exact uh, transla translation, but it's, it's, uh, the, it's a retranslation. It, the website said, the only burden for the relations between the Netherlands and the Philippines is the presence of the leadership of the communist resistance in, the, uh, in, in Holland, which is uh, German season. The Philippines um, favorably um, reacted favorably to the uh, freezing of the assets of Mr. Sison, the Communist Party of the Philippines, and the New People's Army that the Dutch authorities have imposed, amongst others, on the request of the United States. So while in the proceedings they said the United States have nothing to do with this, the website of the uh, Dutch Foreign Ministry said that actually this freezing was done at the request of the United States. When we raised this question in the, or when we, we showed this text in the European Court of Justice, where we were challenging the inclusion of uh, Sir John Macison later in the European list, uh, in fact, the Dutch authorities then withdrew this text, or at least withdrew the last sentence from the website of the uh, uh, Dutch Foreign Ministry. And maybe, I, I didn't uh, look at it today, uh, yesterday, but uh, I think up until now there is the same text, but without this last sentence saying that the freezing was done at the request of the United States. And we will get back to that. We will see later that um, the U.S. pressure, or at least uh, the U.S. intervened again uh, in the process when Joe Macison was, uh, when his inclusion in the list was cancelled by the European Court of Justice. Uh, so, obviously, uh, inclusion under the pressure of the uh, United States. Uh, when we announced that legal action would be taken against this initial inclusion in a Dutch list, uh, Joe Macison, in fact, the Dutch list was then cancelled, and Joe Macison was included in the EU list of terrorists in October 2002 before we could actually take action uh, in Dutch courts, uh, because as you know, he was included in August 2002, then we found out late, or he found out late in the way I, I, I explained to you. And before we were able to take effective action in the Dutch court, he was actually taken off the Dutch list and then put in the European list. The result of that is that a case we, would, we probably would have won in a Dutch court was impossible and we had to uh, file a case in the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg where the proceedings are not very speedy um, and that has led to seven years of proceeding before he was finally uh, taken off that list. Of course when we uh, applied to the uh, European Court of Justice the first thing we uh, said was well could you please explain on which grounds you included this man in, which is the evidence, what, what, what element, what are the elements that you, you have to say that he is involved in organizing or facil facilitating terrorist activity. And in order to do so, we used the EU transparency mechanisms. We uh, asked for access to the file on, the file that was at the, the, the basis of, of the decision of the Council of Ministers to include him in the list. And then we were told that we could not have access to that file because we were told that there actually was no file, which is a rather strange situation because somebody is included in a list, is submitted to extremely harsh sanctions uh, without a file, without anything. We said, well, that's, we can only hear your argument and we will use this, of course, in the proceedings to get him off the list. But uh, if there is no file, then that's, a rather strange situation. Then, of course, the Council, the European Council, understood that probably this was not the good argument. Then came back to the court and said, "No, no, we ha we do have a file. We do, we we do have. No, no, we had a we had a file. But, but, the file was brought by one of the member states 
and was taken back by that member state. So we can't show it to you because it's, we don't have it anymore. It, it was on the table during the discussion and it's, it's gone. So but we can't show it to you. We said, well, can we please know then which was the member state? Because then we can at, at least use national transparency mechanism. We, of course, suspected that it was the, the Dutch state, but we didn't have any formal evidence of, of this. We said, can we please then know which state is uh, brought this file to the discussion so that we can use national transparency mechanisms to try to get access to that file? And then the council said, no, no, that's confidential. You can't, we can't tell you who brought this file. Huh? So at the end of that process, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's the only part we lost in the European uh, Court of Justice. Unfortunately, the European Court of Justice said that this was not in contradiction with the EU transparency rules and that this was an acceptable process, an acceptable uh, situation and that because national security was involved and because diplomatic relations uh, were inv involved, the European Council could actually hide this information from us. So we then challenged this uh, inclusion of Professor Season on the list without any serious knowledge of what had been discussed or what had been on the table when uh, the, Council of the, the European Council of Ministers took uh, this decision. The Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice, annulled the Court of First Instance, annulled the decision the, to include uh, Professor Season in uh, the terrorist list based on the fact that there was no statement of reasons given. And that at least in these kind of proceedings, a statement of reasons should be given to the person or to the entities or the organizations included in the list. The court annulled the inclusion on the 11th of July 2007. That was not a surprise to us because it had already, the Court of Justice had already taken similar decisions uh, in relation to an Iranian organization, the People's Mujahideen of Iran, uh, a few months earlier, uh, saying that uh, some form of due process should be respected, that uh, some form of contradiction should be possible. In April 2007, which means a few months before the court actually took, for the first time, Professor Sison of the list, the European, the Council of, of Ministers has provided us with a statement of reasons saying that, announcing at the same uh, point, that anyhow they would re-include them in the list. The new statement of reasons that Professor Sison received was in fact a one-page, I would say, propaganda pamphlet with absolutely nothing substantial, not one single fact cited, only allegations that CSUN was leading the NPA and that the NPA was responsible for terrorist acts and that etc. etc. Furthermore, the paper, the, the, this so-called statement of reasons, had a very obvious mistake, uh, contained a very obvious mistake. It said that Refugee status was refused to Professor Sison in the 90s by the Dutch State Council. That the Dutch State Council had approved the decision of the Minister of Justice, the Dutch Minister of Justice, to refuse refugee status to Professor Sison. Now, the problem is that anybody who can read and write could see that the Dutch State Council said exactly the contrary of what was said in the Statement of Reasons. The Dutch State Council, in fact, annulled the decision of the Minister of Justice to refuse refugee status to Professor Sisson. So it was obviously wrong. That has led us to uh, a situation in which, after receiving the Statement of Reasons in April 2007, and before a new decision of inclusion was possible, we wrote to the ministry, the foreign ministries of the 27 member states. Of course, we explained why this document was, this statement of reasons was utterly false. And we included a copy of the decision of the Dutch State Council, 
which was in favor of Professor Season and which was cited erroneously in the statement of reasons as being unfavorable to him. Nevertheless, at the time when the court annulled the decision, a few days before the annulment of the previous inclusions in the list, Season was put again on the list with the same statement of reasons, with this statement of reasons containing something which was utterly false. I had the opportunity later to, uh, in an in a, in a expert uh, meeting to which I was invited, to sit beside the representative of one of the European countries in this clearinghouse, which was mentioned earlier, which is in fact the secret group that discusses who is going to be on the list. And I took the opportunity to discuss with the man and I said, well, have you seen in the clearinghouse this letter we've sent you to explain that this was totally false? He said, yes, of course we saw it. Yeah, yeah, we saw it. We, we, we were aware of it. I said, then why did you do it? <laughs> then why did you adopt such a statement of reasons while it was simply untrue? It's not a matter of discussion. It's not a question of interpretation. It's bl black or white. It's very simple. He said, well, you know, there's no discussion in the clearinghouse. We don't discuss matters in the clearing. I said, well, you, what do you mean? He said, no, no, every country brings his list. And then we staple these lists together. Because you imagine if we start discussing the proposal of one of the countries, then that country will start discussing the proposals of other countries. So that's diplomatically impossible. So the only thing we do is staple the lists together. We don't discuss these matters amongst us. Professor Season, of course, when he was re-included in the list after the first uh, judgment by the uh, Court of Justice, we um, challenged the case again. And uh, we took the case again to the European Court, and that's why it took in total nine years, because in fact uh, the first proceeding took from 2002 to 2007, and the second one from 2007 to 2009. Um, the court finally, on more substantial reasons, decided in, December, in September 2009 that Professor Season could not be included in the list. And he was finally taken off the European list, not of the uh, US list, because in the US it's absolutely impossible to challenge the list. There is not even a legal proceeding to challenge it. It's, it's, uh, there's no way to do so. We then found out through WikiLeaks that when Professor Season was taken the second time off the uh, list. The Dutch government actually complained to the US embassy in The Hague uh, that not only the court took him off the list, but that the other European countries were reluctant to appeal the decision, the po decision which was positive for uh, Joma Season, to, to appeal it, uh, the decision in the uh, Court of Justice. Uh, the second level court of justice in, um, in Luxembourg. I think this whole process and th the way it, it developed shows very clearly that uh, we have a very serious problem with democracy uh, in Europe. Uh, the process is totally untransparent. It has nothing to do with the justice or with, 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 a, with a proceeding, with a fair proceeding. Actually, there is no proceeding. At the very start, there is no proceeding at all. It's an obscure political decision taken by a totally undemocratic committee in which, moreover, there is no internal discussion on who uh, will be included on the list or not. And based on that completely untransparent and undemocratic process, severe sanctions are imposed on, on, on persons. In fact, if you look exactly at what, what, it, what was imposed, it's civil debt. Civil debt is was a sanction that existed in France before the, 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 the French Revolution, and it's a total exclusion from social and economical life. And that's actually what happened. Your knowledge only excluded from social benefits, but even your health insurance, and you, you, you can't have an insurance for a car, because that's one of the financial services that cannot be provided to a person included in the list. So you're excluded from economic and social life completely. You are designated, you are uh, targeted publicly uh, as a uh, heinous criminal, which is in fact similar to the proceedings that were 
that were used by the Spanish Inquisition. You also, in the Spanish Inquisition, you were more or less in the same situation as Professor Sisson before the European Court. You had to go and prove your innocence. You had to go there not knowing what the allegations against you were, not knowing what exactly the facts were that the, the accusation was based on, and you had to prove your innocence. I think if we are back to sanctions prior to the French Revolution, based on a proceeding that is even two or three hundred years older than the French Revolution, then we have a serious problem with modern democracy in uh, Europe. Thank you.